Well, I want to give a special welcome tonight to Ben Walker. Ben is um, a member of Knock Presbyterian. He's currently completing his PhD on Galatians, which is great because Galatians is just what we happen to be looking at tonight. So we've really done well for ourselves. Those of you who know me know that I'm, I'm studying at the minute in the theological college and there's some classes that you spend all week dreading and you're not looking forward to. And you're thinking, if I can just get through those two hours, I'll be okay. Classes with Ben are nothing like that. Classes with Ben you look forward to all week and you come out smarter, but also just much more aware of how great Jesus is. So I imagine that's exactly what he's going to do for us tonight. And he'll introduce himself when he comes up later on. Folks, a very good evening to you. Um, it's lovely to be back in Bloomfield and uh, see familiar faces and new old acquaintances and uh, see new faces too. Thanks so much for having me back. Um, thanks for your warm welcome, Philip. Thanks very much for your warm words of welcome. Uh, I, can, I can affirm that it's true that I'm doing a PhD in Galatians. Uh, the rest of what you said is more than generous. Um, I want to read just a section of Galatians uh, at this point, and then we're going to sing again and reflect on that before we come to think about it a little more. Um, the bit I want to read is coming up on the screens here. It's Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. Paul is a, is a great preacher, and he has a lot of weighty things to say, but he also knows that people need a good illustration. So what I want to read uh, is an illustration that Paul uses, a story he tells to illustrate a lot of the heart of what he's about in Galatians. And we'll come back to this briefly at the end of what I say, but let me read these verses to you. As Paul is writing to these people and wanting them to understand what the good news of Jesus really is and really means uh, and how the law of the Old Testament fits into that, uh, he writes this, Galatians 4, 1-7. Let's hear what God has to say to us. What I am saying is that as long as the heir, an heir, is a child, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He's subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. May God bless his word to us this evening. Folks, let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Father God, we've come as people who put our hope in your Son, Jesus, and on whom you have poured out your Spirit. And we thank you that you speak to us by your Spirit. You speak through your Word to lift up our hearts in whatever state we are as we've been singing. So, Lord, we pray that now, as I speak, but as we all dwell on your Word, you would speak by your spirit. You'd speak to each one of us. You'd encourage us. You'd lift us up. You'd open new things about your word to us that are not just new things about your word, but are great and encouraging and uplifting things about your son, our Savior, Jesus. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As uh, Philip said, I've been studying uh, Galatians. Well, let's, let me be honest with you. I've been studying nine verses of Galatians. One word that comes up eight times in nine verses. 
Uh, that's my life in numbers for three years. Um, and uh, so I come, actually, I have to say this evening with a bit of nervousness. I always come with a bit of nervousness when I speak, but this is the first time I've spoken uh, in a church about Galatians in those three years. I've really wanted to steer clear of it um, for loads of reasons. One of them is because I feel like that guy who can't put into simple words what the wood is like without speaking about the detail of the leaves on the trees. So I really hope I'm going to do just a little bit of justice tonight. You are somewhat guinea pigs, <laughs> sorry, um, because this is me trying to put some of it uh, together in words and make sense of some things. But I've sat with it for three years, and let me say I'm biased towards Galatians. I don't know if you're allowed to be biased towards bits of the Bible, but I'm particularly biased towards this letter because of the time I've spent thinking about it. It's made me really take much more, even more to Paul and his skill and his heart in writing this letter. It's made me take much more to Scripture and its richness, the more you spend time thinking about it. It's made me take even more to Christ, who's in and through the heart of this letter. What I want to do, really, is um, approach this in a fairly straightforward way, uh, in a kind of journalistic way, and look at the six questions of journalism, uh, or five W's and an H, you know what they are, what, who, when, where, why, how. Think a little bit about what is this that we read when we're reading a letter, and I gather you're reading through uh, the New Testament, and maybe you've read Galatians already, and you're coming to this and thinking, well, what am I supposed to make of it? Or you're going to read Galatians, um, and hopefully this is, you know, a little bit of a clue in. Think a little bit about the background. Who? When? Where? What's going on? Think why. Why, why was this letter ever written in the first place? What's the big issue? And how does Paul go about it? And how does that say even something to us? Let's start with the W. What? What is it? It's a letter. It's a letter. And in some ways, that sounds uh, a really obvious thing to say. Ben, of course, it's a letter. It's called the Letter of the Galatians. But sometimes that's something we easily overlook when we read the New Testament. This is a letter written to a group of people at a particular time in history. Now, here's something we can see about the Bible and these letters. They weren't written, first of all, to us. They really were written for us. They speak to us. God speaks to us through them. But when they were first written, they weren't written to us. They were written to a particular people, a particular time, in a particular situation that continues to speak. But we do need to think a little bit about that letter and that situation. What I want you to do is imagine you have got an email to write, because we don't, nobody writes letters anymore, do they? Imagine you've got an email to write, and here's the situation. You've got a friend, someone close to you, maybe a family member. And they now live a little way away, and it's been a while since you saw them. When you saw them last, things were going well. Life was fine for them. But you've gathered, uh, you've gathered through the grapevine, you've heard that they've got mixed up with some bad influences. They're making some really dubious choices. They're making some big mistakes. And you know the things they're doing, the mistakes they're making, they're going to have really serious consequences. So you sit down and you think, I've got to say something to them. They're really close to me. I really care for them. What's that email going to look like? How do you go about writing that? How does it compare with uh, that two-line email you write to cancel your magazine subscription? Or that long Christmas email that waffles through everything you've done over the previous year? What does this email look like? This is Paul's situation. And important to bear this in mind as we read Galatians. Here's a real-life letter he's written with a sense of urgency. It's not a biography. It's not a history. It's not a textbook of theology, or Paul's wide-ranging treaties. It's a letter in a situation where Paul is urgently writing to sort something out of people he really cares about and is really concerned about. He wants to persuade people to get back on track. Well, the art of persuasion, uh, we have a word for it, we call it rhetoric. 
uh, the way you go about persuading people of things. And people have thought about how you do that for hundreds of years. And way before Paul, 400 years before Paul, Aristotle, that great philosopher, he wrote books about how you go about persuading people when you speak. And he said there's three things you need to do. You need to have uh, what he called logos. That's some real good arguments, some ideas and some arguments and some conclusions and facts. You need a good argument. But he said you also need a bit of ethos. That is, you need to show people you've got a credible character, that this comes from someone credible. So it's not just about what you say, it's about who it comes from. And the third thing he says is it's got to come with a bit of pathos, a bit of emotional appeal, a bit of passion. So when you read this letter, you'll actually find that all these three things are going on. On one hand, there's a lot of logos in here. There's a lot of theological, biblical argument that Paul's setting out. It's quite deep and in-depth. It takes a bit to pick it apart. But at the same time, probably more than most of his letters, Paul is making a defense of his character, his credibility as the one who's saying this. He gives more personal details about his life and, uh, and his place to be saying this than in a lot of his other letters. It's quite personal. And my word, this letter is emotional too and passionate. Um, listen to the tone of some of these excerpts uh, and I'm going to give the kind of passionate appeal I think is going on with Paul here. Chapter 1. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians. Maybe that'll come up on the screen. That's Paul running away. Foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you just one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Chapter 4. Where? Where then is the sense of the blessing you had? I bear witness, if possible, I know you would have plucked out your eyes for me. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Chapter 5, speaking about the people who he knows are leading the Galatians astray by teaching them circumcision. Think through this statement. As for those agitators, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. What a brutal statement. How passionate is Paul? One eminent Galatian scholar describes this letter as Paul shouting. But to find out why, we need to go back to the background. When, where, and the who. Let me give you a little uh, pressy into this. Uh, there's various views on when and where the Galatian church uh, was and when it happened. A lot of ink has been spilt uh, on this. Uh, I feel like I should say, uh, from a BBC impartiality point of view, um, other opinions are available. Uh, but this is what I think makes sense of Scripture. So, if you follow the storyline of Acts for a minute, uh, you know from the start of Acts, and maybe you've been reading through that already, there's an agenda to Acts when... Uh, Jesus' words say you're going to go from uh, Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And that's what we see happening in the book of Acts. And they go in Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and by chapter 8, uh, they're Samaria. And some people from outside of Samaria are finding about, about the gospel. But the church has got one big problem, and it's persecution, and it comes from this guy called Saul. But Jesus does this amazing thing where he takes the problem and turns it into the solution. So persecutor Saul becomes Paul the missionary to the nations, to the ends of the earth, in chapter 9. And in chapters 10 and 11, we see Peter having this vision, understanding that Gentiles, people from the nations, not just the Jews, can know Jesus and receive the Spirit and be part of the Jesus movement. And that carries on till we get to chapter 13, and we learn how Barnabas and uh, Saul, who's about to be called Paul, are sent out as missionaries from this big hub church in Antioch on a journey. As Paul's first missionary journey it happens, we're talking maybe 47, 48, 49 AD. And they have this strategy where they go to various cities 
And they start off by going to the synagogue where all the Jews are with the heritage and the knowledge of God. And they tell them how Jesus is the fulfillment of their Old Testament and history. Uh, and some of them believe, and quite often others are really antagonistic. So um, Paul and Barnabas then go to maybe the marketplace or where the, the Gentiles, the rest of the people are, and they tell them about this man, Jesus. Uh, and often lots of Gentiles come to faith despite having no background in this, and they receive the Spirit. And so you get these new churches in these places made up of some Jews uh, and lots of Gentiles, people who used to be a pagan religion, but also quite often in in and around the sides, there's some persecution from some antagonistic, non-believing Jews. And this is going to be the case in South Galatia, which is the churches we read about in Acts 13 and 14. Uh, Pisidian in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Some Jews are converted, uh, lots from pagan backgrounds, but some antagonized people from what Paul and Barnabas have said. In the end, they have to move on towards the end of chapter 14. But they've strengthened and encouraged this new church in Galatia. And they left some elders and they've encouraged them. And things seem good to continue and for the church to grow. And Paul and Barnabas head back to Antioch for a while. So that's Paul and that's the Galatian church. But there's another group of who that we need to bear in mind as we read this letter. Luke tells us that uh, a group of people turn up in Antioch. And they're Jewish background believers... And they've got some teaching authority, apparently, uh, and they're linked in maybe with the Pharisees. And they start telling the church in Antioch, unless you have been circumcised, unless you have been circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. You must, you must be circumcised. Gentile believers must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Yes, These people from the nations who weren't Jews, they can be part of the Jesus movement. It's great they are. It's great they receive the Spirit. That's fantastic. But they must be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. Well, Paul and Barnabas get into quite a dispute with them in Antioch, and the whole matter is going to come to a head when the church calls a huge general assembly in Jerusalem uh, about a year or two later to figure it out. But in the meantime the influence of a similar group of people has spread up to the Galatian churches. And these Jewish background believers in Jesus, who apparently come with some authority from Jerusalem, from HQ, and who are teaching that all believers, all Gentiles, must be circumcised and follow the law of Moses to the Galatian churches. And the thing is, it must be quite a powerful argument. Because, as Paul says in his letter... Back in Antioch, even Peter and Barnabas were swayed by what they said. Paul, in fact, had to have a stand-up face-to-face with Peter about it. And Paul must have gathered that in the church in Galatia, a lot of people, predominantly from a, a Gentile background, are also being influenced towards being circumcised and keeping the law and celebrating special feast days according to the law. And that so vexes Paul that, in my guess, probably before the Jerusalem Council, but after he finds out about this, he thinks, I've got to write this letter. I've got to sit down and knock out this email to set the Galatians straight. So we get what's probably one of, if not the earliest, letter of Paul. But let me ask you this question. Why? And there's a couple of why questions in here. Not First, why does Paul write the letter? But why would these Galatians even be persuaded? What is such a strong argument about this? We're people who've had the letter for the Galatians for, you know, 2,000 years. And the history of this being scripture, and we automatically think, I mean, it's crazy these people think they need to be circumcised. What about faith? And anyway, why would anyone want to be circumcised? So here's been you know, a history of centuries where Gentile people could be part of the kind of Jewish movement, God-fearing Gentiles, they're called, who kind of buy in slightly but don't go the full way because they don't really fancy being circumcised. That's been the history and the heritage of that. So what is it about this message where all these Gentiles suddenly think that is the thing we really must do? Think for a moment with me. What do are, what are new converts need? 
In fact, what does any human like you or me need to feel part of something? We need a kind of assured sense of our identity, don't we? That we're part of it. That we're right with God. That we're his loved children. That we're part of his people and his family. That we've got a sure hope of what's to come. We need that assurance of that identity. And we also need that clear sense of purpose. What are we about? How should we live? What does it look like being a Christian? How should we be distinctive? WWJD, what would Jesus do? So here's a group of people largely used to their kind of idol worship, where they got all that sense of identity from their rituals. But now they've encountered Jesus and the power of his spirit. And Paul thinks he's left them with a clear and assured sense of who they are and their future and what they're about. That they're humans, like you and me. So here come this group of teachers, and Paul calls them agitators, which shows you what he thinks of them. And they have an answer for these Galatians who want to be assured of where they stand and what life should look like. Put yourself in their shoes for a moment and imagine what it might be that these teachers, these agitators are saying. Maybe it's something like this. You know, it's, it's great. It's great you Gentiles have faith in Jesus, the Messiah, who lived and died and rose again. We believe that. He's the fulfilment of our cherished hope. That's great. And by God's grace, we see you know, you've been given the Spirit too. Wonderful. We're here to help you figure out what it looks like to be God's people, to be assured of your status and identity, to live obedient and holy and distinctive lives. Uh, of course, that is the Jewish heritage of our Old Testament. We're God's chosen distinctive people. God gave us, Abraham's offspring, through Moses, his law to know how to live. And it's this law that helps you know you're part of God's family, you're right with him now and forever, and that you can lead holy and purposeful lives. So you need to be circumcised. It's what it says there in the Old Testament, in the law. It's the mark of God's promised people. And WWJD, he was a good Jew. He was circumcised. I mean, if you're not, then you can't be sure you're part of God's promised people in Christ. And we can't eat with you because we've all got to be precious about our holiness, haven't we? I mean, Christ won that for us on the cross. You wouldn't want to trample on the grace of Jesus, would you? You wouldn't want to live unworthy lives, would you? Compromise lives. No. And of course, there's these festivals... And days were commanded to celebrate. You've got to do these things to show that you're part of God's distinctive people, to show the people around you what it looks like. Look, here's a clear set of things to do to be a member of God's people. It's straightforward. You do them. Don't swan around doing what you like. Get serious about doing what God says. You've got underway, but you won't inherit what God has promised unless you get back to this Torah law and start getting serious about it. And you could sense how, for a lot of people, that would feel appealing. It gives me a sense of assurance. It gives me a sense of purpose. Clear guidelines on what to do. Possibly they were saying things about Paul as well, maybe. You know, we're a bit concerned about Paul. You know Paul, who was with you for a while, but you know he's now gone. That Paul. We're a bit concerned about his gospel. It sounds a bit like cheap grace to us. It sounds like he's completely doing away with the precious law of Moses and just saying to you, all you need to do is believe. <laughs> it's a bit more than that, isn't it? We wonder if Paul is just a bit of a people pleaser. You know, just trying to take the challenging bits out of the gospel, you know, like circumcision to get some of you Gentiles to believe. Is that really the actions of an apostle? I'd like to stand up to Peter like that. Listen, we're, we're from Jerusalem. We're from headquarters. We've come with some authority. Uh, and Paul is, actually, he's under them too. And probably if he's listened to them, he's away 
teaching circumcision now. So you know we're on the right track. Listen, we're really concerned for you and your salvation. We're here for you. We want you to know how you have to live. But unless it's like us, you're going to be in eternal danger, nullifying the grace of Jesus. You won't inherit what God has promised. So move on from what Paul has told you. This is the gospel. You need to believe in Jesus and do these things from the law. Why is it such a big issue for Paul? Well, for Paul, this teaching doesn't give the Galatians a true assurance of their identity and purpose. He says it's nothing less than another gospel. In fact, a damnable gospel. No gospel at all. It is not good news for you, says Paul. It doesn't understand the true good news of Jesus doesn't understand the point of the law and this is not good news because it will take from you Jesus and his grace and hope. So how does Paul go about addressing all this as he sits down to write this letter? Well for one thing he writes a passionate letter that gets straight to the point. I don't know if you recognize this in reading it But Paul doesn't mess around at the start of Galatians. Other letters he writes, he has a nice little intro, a bit of a prayer for the people. In Galatians, he's five verses in before he's saying, I am astonished at you. What, no no nice prayer for how you're always thanking God for us? No, straight in. Also, at times along the way, Paul has some questions about the motivations of these agitators. He says, these people who advocate circumcision, honestly, they're doing it to avoid persecution from the non-believing Jews. They just want to keep things sweet. But sometimes, when you follow the good news for what it really is, persecution is part of the territory. He says, they may be zealously concerned for you, but actually, it's not really for you or any good purpose. They just want to boast about their discipleship achievements. They've got ministry figures they want to show, numbers they want to chalk up. They don't actually pastorally care for you and where you're at. And he says those who are circumcised, they actually don't keep the whole law themselves. Watch out for people who say, do what I say, but don't do what I do. But Paul's major theme is to drag the Galatians back to what the good news of Jesus is, the gospel. There's three big sections. Uh, And the first one, Paul defends his credibility and his gospel, what he preaches. He says, actually, what I preach is legitimate. It's endorsed by the wider church in Jerusalem. But I'm I'm nobody's puppet. I'm no people pleaser. This is the gospel that Jesus himself taught me that I want to share with you. And my word, I've been through some opposition for your sake so that you could hear it. This is the gospel, I tell you, he says. And in the, the third big section of the letter, later on, he wants to say to them, actually, only the good news, this gospel, can help us to live as God calls us to live. He says, it, it does matter how we live as Christians. It really does that we're distinctive. But we're led in that by the Spirit in us, not by slavishly obeying laws. Actually, says Paul, how Christians are marked out is by their love. All the law is fulfilled in this one commandment. Love your neighbor. How Christians are marked out is by their fruitfulness, their love, their joy, their peace, their patience, their kindness, their goodness, their faithfulness, their gentleness, their self-control. All that comes from the spirit in you, not from slavishly obeying the law. The law doesn't and never has had the power to change you, says Paul. Actually, there's a suggestion he makes in here that the more they get obsessed with the law and their performance in doing it, the worse the relationship in the church gets. They bite one another and devour one another and they provoke one another and there's kind of barely suppressed vice under the surface. 
says, while the law is a good thing, it has its place. Actually, when you get focused on just doing it, for the sake of doing it, church becomes individualistic and performance-based and judgmental and all about comparison. You look around thinking, I'm holier than he is. I'm lovely as holy as she is. That's not the loving family of God, says Paul. Only Christ killing that power of sin in us by his death and only his spirit in us producing love and fruitfulness actually changes us into the people God calls us to be, not slavishly doing the law. And the major chunk in the middle is where Paul gets down to his big argument. He begins with what he said to Peter in Antioch. Maybe he's telling the story straight from what they've heard on the grapevine. And he develops that into his argument to the Galatians. He says the gospel has always been about people from everywhere, not just the Jews, but people from everywhere being justified. That is being made right with God and knowing they're right with God and being part of his family by being in Christ, by putting their faith in Christ. We live with a sure sense of identity and hope because we are, as Paul talks again and again, with this little phrase, in Christ. What is true for Jesus is true for us because he lives in us and we live in him. The Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Paul wants his readers to see they don't need anything more to assure them of who they are, where they stand, and their purpose in life. They don't need to do the things the law has said. There was a time and a purpose and a past for the law, but that time has passed with the coming of Jesus. So Paul uses that illustration that we read earlier in chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, to show that bigger story of God's salvation plan and how the law of Moses, however powerful an argument it seems, actually once had its place in the past, but no longer has that place. He says, for the Jews before Jesus' time, the law was a bit like a childhood instructor, a bit like a nanny, a strict nanny. Now, I know you hear that, and you're going to look at me and think, he's got quite well to do English accent, and he's wearing chinos. Did he have a nanny? I didn't have a nanny. Maybe none of us had a nanny, but we've all seen Downton Abbey. We all know how it works. God the Father set a strict nanny in place for his children before they would come of age. And of course, in those days, actually, a child's life could be pretty rigidly disciplined and gently unpleasant. No different to being a slave because strict nanny ruled the roost. This nanny would clearly and frequently point out sin and identify how much they needed someone to come and make good while they kept failing. Of course, God's child, Israel, had failed and been exiled, as the Old Testament tells us. But Paul says the law, strict nanny, was never designed to make them right and give them a heart to do what was right by their father. The law didn't have that power. That could only come by Christ coming to make things new. When Christ comes, that's like the coming of age for God's children. The Jews who lived under the law before, under strict nanny, but believed, Jesus made right all their failings and gave them full status as sons of God, like him. The Spirit assures them of that. The whole estate is theirs, as promised. But wider than just the Jews, all the people of the nations, the Gentiles, complete outsiders who had none of that background, who'd never been brought up under a strict nanny, but had just given their lives to pagan worship. They too, as they believed, were given full status as sons of God, heirs of the whole estate. When you're a kid and you live under nanny, there are rules you must obey. When you come of age as the heir of the house, 
You don't have mammy anymore. It's not that when you've grown up, it doesn't matter how you live. It's not that there weren't lots of good things that nanny taught you about saying please and thank you at the right times. You want to live in a way that honours your parents and the way that you've been loved and shown. But you don't do that by going back to live under nanny's strict rule. Nanny's rules have their point, but nanny's rules aren't designed to make you lovingly do the right thing. For that, you need a willing and able heart and spirit. And that is what Jesus brings, and that is what the Spirit brings to us, says Paul. So he's not saying we shouldn't read the Old Testament law and take seriously what it teaches about God and his ways, especially to the Gentiles who have never grown up in it. But he is saying, do you think we must go back to obeying all the things in the law, such as circumcision, back to the unpleasantness of slavish childhood, where you did things simply because you were told to, back to fearful life under strict nanny, is crazy when you should be living as the free children of a loving father. It's like saying, and maybe there's a last picture to illustrate this, not as the dunce saying, I will be good, I will be good, I will be good, I will be good, but the free worshipping child. To go back to the first is like saying, I never came of age, that Jesus never set me free. It's like saying Jesus never really needed to set me free because actually if I work really, really hard under nanny's rules, I can make it right all of the time. But you can't. We need Jesus to do it for us and in us. Paul says, don't go back to slavery. You might as well go back to your pagan religion and try and get your sense of identity in doing, doing, doing. Your performance, your performance, your performance. Comparison with other people. But Jesus says, it's not about doing. It's done. On the cross for you. You are sons of God. You will inherit. So let me encourage you to read Galatians and feel the letter, feel the argument, feel Paul's angst, and recognize how powerful and tempting it is to look to other things to assure us of our place and our future and purpose with God, our holy performance and our outward acts and the list of things we must do. But if even the law of Moses wasn't designed to make you and keep you right with God, nothing else we do will either. Instead, read Galatians and know that from the very beginning, God has promised in Christ to make us right with him. No longer a slave to fear, no longer a slave to sin, but a loved child of God. And because of Jesus and his faithfulness, because he was crucified and became that curse where we were cursed, and because he set his spirit in our hearts, we can know for sure, for sure, that we are the children of God, that we are loved, that we have his power in us to live in fruitful and loving ways, that we have a hope for the future which begins now and is certain and guaranteed. I hope you enjoy reading Galatians, even a, a little bit of what I have. <laughs> and may God bless you and teach you and open you up to his son Jesus more and more as you do. Folks, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that we have, not because of what we have done or do, but because of what you have done, Lord Jesus, and the fact that we are in you. Lord, we get so tempted to do things to make us feel right and good with you. 
we get so tempted to compare ourselves with other people. Our hearts get so drawn towards who we are and the things we do and how we compare. But again and again, you point us back to Jesus and say, look to my son, the one who loved you and gave himself for you. Remember, you live in him and he lives in you. Lord, remind us of this again and again. Give us the freedom of the children of God who live in love for you, desiring to live lives that honour you, walking in step with your spirit, producing us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And may we bring glory and honour to your name, our gracious God. Amen. Let's pray together again. Father, again, we just want to thank you this evening for your word. We thank you for the Bible, and we thank you that as we've been working through the books of the New Testament, you have been speaking to us and leading us and showing us more of who you are. Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you for the hope that we can find in Jesus. We thank you that we can say, I am forgiven. And that it is this that defines us. We thank you that it's not what we do, but what Jesus has done. And so we pray that you would help us never to add any requirements. May we never fall into legalism. May we never go back to living under a nanny. May we never distort your good news. But would we proclaim with our lives, with our words, with all that we do, the incredible grace that we have been shown in Jesus. Father, we know that only the gospel through the Spirit enables us to live for you. And so, Father, by your Spirit, we pray that you would shape us into the people you want us to be. Help us to live lives marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Help us to know that we do that only in your power. And so we thank you that we are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that that brings us freedom that is only from Christ. Father, we pray for those who are part of our church family who would love to be with us this evening, but for different reasons cannot. We pray that you would draw near to those who are ill, who are traveling, who are just going through a difficult patch. Would you make them aware of your love, of your keeping and of your care? And Father, as we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ, we want to pray this evening for people who are in bondage. Father, we want to pray for the parts of our local community that are under the bondage of paramilitaries. Father, we want to pray against them and the demonic effect that they have on our society. Father, we thank you for the statement that church leaders in this area have made during the week, but we pray that you'd help us to be a people who do not only say the right things, but do the right things and are able to offer support to people and to make a difference in our community. And Father, we also want to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who do not enjoy the same freedoms that we have but who are under bondage, who are in chains because they proclaim your name. So we pray for all who face persecution. We pray, Lord, that you would help them to stand firm in the promises that you have made, that you would give them endurance, that you would give them patience, that you would give them strength in you, that you would give them hope. And then, Lord, we want to pray for those closer to home, those who are known to us, who are struggling with the bondage of addiction, or sinful patterns, who no matter how hard they try, they don't seem to be able to change. Father, we pray that you would be with them, that they would know of your love, and that you would help them to be able to turn away from the things that keep them from you, and to walk more closely with you. Father, we pray that we would be a church that is transformed by your gospel. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be shaping us into the people that you want us to be, and we pray 
that you would help us to face this coming week sure of exactly who we are in Christ, that we are free, we are chainless, and that we can face the week saying, all that we do is not I, but through Christ in me. Lead us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.